Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum at the Harvard Kennedy School. My name is Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics. I want to welcome, in particular, the freshmen who are here in the audience today. The weather today, is this is what it's going to be like in January, so you guys will be good in good shape. 45 years ago, uh, the G Institute of Politics was founded as a living memorial to President John F. Kennedy, and its mission is to inspire students uh, to a career in politics, uh, and we do that with a number of things. We have great, outstanding fellows every semester. We have wonderful and exciting and interesting forums almost every night. We offer great internships, but we also have the opportunity for students to interact with a director of the Institute who uh, spends several years man running, the, running the operations, working with the staff, and we've had some extraordinary men and women over the years who have been the director. So we thought this year to help honor and celebrate our 45th anniversary in the year, the 375th year of Harvard University and the 75th year of the Kennedy School, uh, that we'd have a discussion today on what is really an important topic right now, which is civility, or the lack thereof, in our politics and our discourse. Uh, so we've got several of our former directors here on stage with me. We have one director who's gonna join us via satellite, and we have all of you in the audience to help engage in a great conversation over the next hour to hour and a half. I also wanna acknowledge, especially because it's his birthday, the dean of the Kennedy School, David Elwood, who's here in the front row. We're not gonna sing though, David, but, but thank you for coming to that. So to begin, I want to introduce uh, via satellite our first former director, United States Senator Jean Shaheen, Democrat from New Hampshire. She's joining us via video link. Senator Shaheen served as the governor of the state of New Hampshire from 1997 to 2002. She served as an IOP fellow in the spring of 2003 and was our director from 2005 to 2007. And Senator Shaheen, we're glad to have you here. We know you had a conflict that prevented you from being here in person. So we're excited you could join us via satellite. And I thought I'd just kick it off with you and ask, uh, is there hope? You're in Washington right now. <laughs> is there hope for us going forward? And thanks for, thanks for joining us. Senator Shaheen. Thanks, Trey. I'm sorry I can't be there in person with all of you. I'm actually in New Hampshire uh, this afternoon. And I can't be there because I have to go to a big political dinner tonight at New Hampshire's Institute of Politics. So um, I. I um, first want to congratulate you, though, Trey. I haven't officially been down to the Kennedy School to say we're so glad that you have taken on the new position as IOP director. And I know you're bringing innovative um, leadership to the IOP, and the students really love it, I've heard. Thanks. Thank you. I'm really glad to be there with my former directors, um, former fellow directors, to talk about an issue that I think we all believe is very important, and that is how do we return civility to public discourse? Is there really hope to do that? Um, because my time is limited, I, I want to just make three quick points. First of all, I think there is no doubt that politics has gotten meaner in the 35 or so years that I've been involved in politics. And there are some reasons for that. Um, 24, the 24-hour news cycle, cable television, talk radio, and probably negative campaign ads are as much to blame as anything else. You know, I had, when I was running for the Senate in 2002, uh, I remember one morning my two-year-old granddaughter said to my daughter, um, about my opponent, she said, Mommy, why does he want to kill Govey? Um, which is what she calls me. And uh, uh, my daughter had to explain that he really didn't intend to do that at all. It was really about the, the campaign ads. But I think it's that impression that too often gets left with people that um, it's much more antagonistic than we intend. So secondly, I think, unfortunately, it's not just political discourse that has um, gotten so difficult and challenging. It's really too much of our public dialogue, whether it's the media and entertainment, reality TV. You know, it's always the people who are the most difficult, the most um, outspoken, um, who seem to be the stars on reality TV. Even sports events, um, all you have to do is go to an athletic event, and too often you hear 
uh, language and commentary that we don't, that's very unsportsmanlike. Um, so it's not just politics, it's our whole public dialogue that I fear has gotten um, too destructive and that is no longer really civil. Um, the third point I want to make is that as I think about what we need to do to restore confidence in our political system and in our government, I think figuring out how to address this issue is really critical. Um, to make people feel like they can trust government again, that those of us who are political leaders are adults who are trying to address the very difficult challenges that we face. And I don't think there's a magic bullet to do that. I think it's all about each of us trying to do a better job as we think about what we say, to not be accusatory, to recognize that we can disagree, we can talk about complex issues, and we don't have to make that personal. Um, so I wish there were a magic solution to it, but I think it's really all about each one of us, regardless of whether we're in the political arena or whether we're student politicians or whether we're faculty members, um, parents, whatever we are, trying to be more civil and careful about what we have to say. Thanks, Senator, for the introductory comments. What a good way to keep up the discussion. Uh, I thought I'd begin with to, uh, the gentleman to my left, Jonathan Moore, who was the longest serving IOP director. He's currently associated with the Shorenstein Center on Press, Politics, and Public Policy here at the Kennedy School. Uh, Jonathan served as a U.S. ambassador to the United Nations from 1989 to 1992, was actually an IOP fellow in 1990. 66 to 67 and one the inaugural group and served as director from 1974 to 1986. Jonathan kids me that I want to come close to breaking his record as the longest serving director, but I don't want to actually break it because then I will have been here too long uh, as the director. So Jonathan, uh, building maybe off what Jean, Jean said or even just uh, all the experiences of being one of the one of the first groups of fellows here and the di director for a long time, you know, how has it changed? Do you see any any hope, uh, or is this you know, maybe much to do about nothing? We've had a lot of incivility in our nation's history. Well, going back to the beginning, <clears throat> you said I was one of the uh, inaugural fellows. And looking at some of the comments that Jacqueline Kennedy gave to Arthur Schlesinger this week or last week, well, a long time ago, but they've just been released, as you know. We had a great celebration when the Kennedy School was inaugurated and the Institute of Policy with it, the Institute of Politics with it. And at that point, the Institute of Politics was the lead. Uh, it had uh, a, an endowment of its own. It had the Kennedy family behind it. And it had uh, a brand new original director of the Institute of Politics, Dick, Dick Neustadt. So they arranged, and we were all dressed in black tie. And we were arranged in a, in a special room just for this purpose, all lined up. And then Dick Neustadt escorted Jacqueline Kennedy in to the room to meet these spectacular new fellows which were going to lead American politics for the next X years. And she came in, and we were all agog, and we were all stiff in our monkey suits. <laughs> and uh, she was extremely gracious. She, stopped and shook hands with each one of us and asked what was on our mind and had a little small conversations and moved through the whole group. Very uh, impressed with us, very delighted at the whole idea of the Institute and its fellows, particularly these political fellows who would come in and make a dynamic contribution to the uh, education of the university, but also then would be, would be nurtured here and would go back out to lead. And after this, she'd accomplished uh, visits with the whole group. Uh, she bowed graciously, and Richard Neustadt escorted her out the door. And at the door, she said to him, who were they? <laughs> <laughs> so I think maybe I'll have a chance to talk about the subject at hand later and I should, I should let you move along to the next director. Okay, although you think about that. And I've already thought about it, I'm already ready. <laughs> okay, to, uh, to Jonathan's left is uh, Jim Leach. Uh, 
former Congressman Jim Leach is currently the chairman of the National Endowment for Humanities, where he's actually been traveling the country the last couple of years on a civility tour, talking about this topic with uh, academics, school-aged children, and everyday Americans all across the country. Uh, Congressman Leach served in Congress uh, for a couple, almost a couple of decades and served as an IOP director uh, for one year uh, and after his tenure in Congress ended. So we're pleased to have you back, Congressman, Mr. Mr. Chairman. And uh, what's, uh, what have you learned about traveling around the country? You know, what have you heard? What message are you delivering? And, and uh, again, what's your, you know, what's your take on this? Well, the, the country is incredibly diverse, uh, but there's a, a totality of sense that something's going to skew in the American political process. And <clears throat> part of it relates to this question of civility, which is largely misunderstood. Civility is hardly just about manners. Some people think it's kind of a sanctimonious concept, but uh, basically it's about whether people want to respect someone else's view, whether there's a sense of empathy for other people. Uh, I would just like to make a, a couple of quick points. When I uh, was a young person, I was disproportionately interested in, in sports. And then when I entered politics, I used to make these one-to-one -one analogies between sports and politics. When I left a political life, I came to the conclusion that those analogies were no longer one-to-one. -one. Sports, despite a few uh, instances that happen now and again, has a substantially higher ethic than politics. Uh, and I don't mean this exactly as kind of a, a, a joke, but the fact of the matter is, uh, in athletics, there are referees, there are rules. Uh, in politics, there are no referees, and uh, there are uh, very few rules. Uh, in sports, you have this great uh, uh, sports writer three quarters of a century ago named Grantland Rice who said, it's not winning and losing that matters most, it's how you play the game. Well, the temper and integrity of the political fight is actually much more important than the outcome of most issues. And we have really broken down in temper and integrity. We've lost respect for each other. And that matters a great deal. Uh, now, the last point I'd like to make is that uh, the American people are very much angst-ridden. And it's my view uh, for very good reason. Uh, but for the very same reason that the American people are angst-ridden, and it partly relates to the best and the brightest in America having lit the country down a bit over the last decade and a half, uh, it's a reason that the political process ought to come together and do much better, and among other things, think about the old line concepts that uh, all of you that are young will read at, at, at this great university and at universities around the country, uh, political theory that says we ought to be concerned with the common good for the public welfare. When is the last time you've heard a, a politician say, I'm for the common good? Uh, instead, they're saying, I'm for this interest group's interest. And we have a battle of interest groups, not a battle to advance something that is in the common uh, wheel. And, and so uh, I think for the reason the public is so upset, politics has to reform. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I introduce our last two panelists, we need to say uh, goodbye to Senator Shaheen. I know she's got, got to go. Do you have any further comments, Senator? Uh, otherwise, tell our folks at the New Hampshire Institute of Politics hello and, and, uh, and have a great evening. And thank you for joining us. Thanks, Trey. So to Chairman Leach's left is former Congressman from Indiana, Phil Sharp. Uh, Phil has actually served as the IOP director twice, uh, first from 1995 to 1997, and then again from 2004 to 2005. In between those stints and continuing today, he's been at a, an environmental, energy, and natural resources policy think tank, an independent group and called Resources for the Future, where he serves as president and is one of the nation's foremost experts on energy and natural resource policy. Welcome back, Congressman Sharp. Thank you. Um, I, I would just to point out something that uh, Senator uh, Jean Shaheen and, uh, and, and you just mentioned as a part of civility because I think civility comes and goes in, in families and churches and in places like that and it certainly is at a low level in our public life uh, at the moment. But the aspect that I would put a higher priority on is finding a way for us to have more intelligent conversation on the public arena and the public dialogue as you were uh, alluding to. And part of this is a modern phenomenon that we are so, such a distracted society. 
we are bombarded, and I suspect some of you right now are answering your emails and Twitter and all the rest of it, uh, <laughs> which you can keep up with. And uh, I applaud you for your ability to multitask. I'm not as effective. But uh, the issue uh, is, can we, if, if you remember the Lincoln-Douglas debates, which you might not be old enough to remember. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> but when you went to church for a sermon in that era, when you went to a political rally, they went on for hours. Most of us would find this unbelievably offensive, and we couldn't involve. And so I'm not trying to get us to go back to that. But we do need to find a way that we can have more consistent conversation. Even here at Harvard, it is a very hard thing in the classroom, on this forum, or anywhere else to keep anything sustained focus on any kind of major issue. Now, I happen to care and be deeply involved in policy issues around climate change. And you know we had this outrageous, uh, know-nothing kind of uh, public debate uh, in Washington, DC. And some of the people were, who are, the, one of the problems you always have you have to ask yourself about politicians and diplomats and everybody else, to what audience are they speaking? Because sometimes they aren't as stupid as they sound. They're actually trying to appeal to some specific interest. And you discover being in the Congress, oh my goodness, that man or woman actually is quite intelligent and quite knowledgeable. And I, they just said the dumbest thing you ever heard uh, kind of proposition. But anyway, one of the things our goals ought to be is to try, and it's something the Kennedy School is focused on, it's something the Institute of Politics is focused on, is how to upgrade that. And, and let's be honest, I'm not interested, and I don't know any other human being that's interested in being persistently that way. <laughs> what we're trying to do is just upgrade more time in the public arena actually gets on to serious questions where we do raise and get out front the value conflicts and the factual conflicts that are going to be inevitable. Our final speaker this evening, Dan Glickman, is currently the executive director of the Aspen Institute Congressional Program, where he actually works on issues like this. He served in Congress from 1977 to 1994, and as the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture from 1995 to 2001. Uh, Dan was the IOP director from 2002 uh, to 2004. Welcome back, Dan. Thank you, Trey. Um, you know, I'm reminded it was, I think, Keynes who said, for every complicated problem, there is a simple and a wrong solution. Uh, it may have been, I, I think it was Keynes. It's either Keynes or H.L. Mencken, but you, there's, a, there's a test after. Well, they're probably out looking yeah, it up. Yeah, right. But, you, know. you, can Google it, well, you can Google it and tell me what it is. But anyway, uh, it's a complicated issue because, as the others have pointed out, uh, there's a myriad of ways to define this. But I think there are a few issues here that really uh, uh, are important. One is culture. When I was at the Motion Picture Association, I was responsible for the ratings of movies. Now, if you look at a movie today that gets a PG-13, that movie 15 or 20 years ago, uh, I'm not sure that we had all the same ratings then, probably wouldn't have gotten a PG-13. Right. Uh, there are various tests, uh, language, sex, um, violence, and those kinds of things. So I think the culture has changed and our rhetoric has changed. The nature of the media has caused us to change a, a bit with it. And I agree with all the folks who've talked about it here. I think Money in politics has a factor that we've never seen before. When I ran for Congress, I defeated an incumbent Republican congressman and spent a total of $100,000, primary and general. That race today would be anywhere between two and five million dollars, and you never n will know where the money's coming from today. What does that mean? That means it's frenetic, saturated search for money. It means appealing for people uh, and most of them have an axe to grind. People do not give you money because they like your hairline or the way you look. They give you money because they want access and, and hopefully influence in the process. And I, I think that's changed the political system a lot. I th the third thing is leadership. The folks in, in government today, I'm not sure they come to government with principles of leadership adequately taught to them or know enough about them. And, and leadership requires a lot of skills that I, hopefully you're learning here at the Kennedy School and, and at Harvard generally. What does it take to be a good leader? What kind, of, what kind of capacity do you have to be just not a follower, but a leader? It was Harry Truman who said, the, a statesman is someone who gets people to do what, they, what he should, be do, do, should be done, but, but they don't want to do it. And so the, the job is to be persuasive there. And the final thing is bigger than just politics. It has to do with our democracy and the issues we face. I think we're seeing a little bit the aging of the American political democracy. And we're seeing uh, people looking at this country maybe 
no longer exactly the way they looked at it after the Second World War. And the economic anxieties are very high. And I'm sure there are anxieties of people graduating and going to college and graduating and not sure what their, where their future lies. And I think those anxieties cause the people to be a lot more internally divisive. And as they're more internally divisive, their, their politicians are more internally divisive. And, and uh, I'm not blaming anybody for this. I think it's a fact of life. And I think it's tough for politicians to know how to address the problems of the people when they're no longer easily resolvable, either in the public sector or the private sector. And I think that that contributes to the situation that we have today. Before we open it up to questions, I want to throw a question out just to, to all of you, and any or all of you may, may address it. Uh, we did subtitle this, Is There Hope? Uh, I haven't heard a lot of hope <laughs> in any of the comments. Um, I also haven't heard a lot of potential solutions. And I got to confess, I struggle with this. I, I, I get invited to give speeches on this topic all the time, and I always feel like I should be, you know, I'm the director of the Institute of Politics. I need to provide guidance and solutions. and proposals, and I, I struggle with it. Phil. I mean, I actually, I, I am, because our system tends to be historically, and maybe I just have a, a, a faith that is misplaced, but it tends to be self-corrective. If we saw what happened with the debt ceiling thing, that was a very low moment. I don't know, probably join many of you in being so angry uh, every morning that I got up at a different target every day uh, for what I thought was their behavior. One people forget they actually got the decision within the deadline. Mm -hmm. It wasn't necessarily right. a great decision, but they got the decision. They did not miss the deadline. I, nobody even talks about that. Right. The second, but more importantly, is what I think happened. What we were going through is a period in which we have the jockeying and the testing for where does the political power lie in the country? Who's really uh, up and who's really down. And we were at a very unknown point because we'd had the turnover in the House, we'd had the Tea Party rise up, and each new group is trying to reassess, are we really, the people are really behind us and they should be following us. Uh, and what happened was, in that process, two things. One is, we really got the comeuppance as a country and the political leadership did that just making the deadline wasn't good enough. It undermined the confidence, we think, among Americans as consumers, as investors, and whatnot, and actually may have contributed to a, a, uh, a dampening on the economy. Now, that is a different phenomenon than we've sometimes seen in the past. But notice what happened to the political leaders themselves. They got battered and bashed, and if they're, unless they're really stupid, they understand that they cannot stand up there and say, well, the people were with us. The people have said back very loud and very clear, Mr. President, we don't think you're quite doing what you ought to be. Mr. Tea Party, you're not doing the job right. New Republicans in the House, you're not doing the job right. Everybody took a very negative bath. Notice what we've seen since mm -hmm. that time. What we've seen since that time is the President has obviously, what he put before the Congress was something he would not have put before the Congress two years before. It was a more centrist, pragmatic kind of proposals, which he didn't any longer have to fight anybody in the Democratic Party about because they all had taken such a bath. They knew you had to do something serious and practical. The Republican leadership responded, at least in tone, in a way that we didn't hear. Now, that, this doesn't mean the fight's over and the battle's over or anything like that. But what has happened is everybody's gotten their comeuppance, and unless they're really stupid, and I don't believe most of them are, um, they are going to learn something and the behavior is going to start to change. Because, folks, you've got to go back to the electorate. And when you go back to them, you learn some things. And, uh, and they're very demanding. You are the electorate. <laughs> so, but Dan, Dan just briefly, uh, one, one solution significantly reduce the amount of money in the political system. Now, that's easier said than done because uh, we have some constitutional issues there. But uh, I noticed there was a CEO named Howard Schultz, head of Starbucks, who's trying to start a trend to get role models in our society to try to demand less money in our political system. And uh, it's pie in the sky, but I have to tell you that you, you, it's very hard to have a free-flowing political system that engages problems like education, health care, transportation, energy, if everybody is boxed into a system whereby they rely on massive amounts of money to survive. That's one thing. The second thing, this is a little more tongue in cheek, but I run this program at the um, Aspen Institute where I take members of Congress around the country and around the world uh, to talk about issues. 
and you take 20 members of Congress outside of Washington, half Republican, half Democrat, they don't act like Republicans and Democrats anymore. So I've thought about, let's move the Capitol, make it a roving Capitol, move it all <laughs> over the world, just have this legislature meet lots of different places beyond Washington. I, I'm, so I guess my point there is, is it's not hopeless, mm -hmm. but the problems of the country are so severe and serious and we're in this global economy now where there's no longer capable of simple solutions that we have to find ways to, for our leaders to address these problems. And right now our system, there are too many disincentives to get them to address the problem. Sure, let's work our way back. Uh, Jim, Jonathan, then we'll uh, dive into Q&A. Well, I want to uh, piggyback a little bit on what uh, Dan said. Uh, the money in politics issue is uh, singularly significant. Uh, if you ask the public what's wrong, they say people aren't attuned to their points of view. This is true of someone on the left, it's true of someone in the middle, it's true of people on the right. And then you ask why, and it has something to do with the fact uh, uh, that Republicans and Democrats, for all the divergence, also have some commonalities. And one is that virtually everybody in Washington is deeply indebted to deep-pocketed institutions whether they be corporations, unions, or individuals. And it's a very severe problem, and it's been magnified, of all things, by one of the greatest of all American institutions, the Supreme Court of the United States. And in this ruling, Citizens United, uh, <coughs> which has uh, uh, twisted the English language, that is, that's held that money is speech, <coughs> and it's held that a corporation is an individual, therefore, under the First Amendment of the United States, you cannot stop a corporation from giving certain types of money in the political process. <coughs> this has to be reversed. And it can only be reversed by the court changing its mind, by new members of the court, uh, or by a constitutional amendment. And the public has to tell people that this truly, truly matters. Uh, and then uh, uh, there has to be something about public financing. And it doesn't have to be total public financing. You can have matching contributions of small, of, of small contributors. But you have to change the money in politics issue. If you don't, you have a, a nationalized polity of everybody in the process that become indebted to people with deeper pockets. And it makes a government that's not of, by, and for the people. It's a government of, by, and for uh, those people that either control other people's money or their own money in disproportionate ways. Uh, and I, 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 I will just end with this whole notion that there are some very unfortunate words out there like communist, fascist, applied to American political figure, or terrorist for that matter. By the same token, the worst lack of comedy in the United States of America can be very civil speech. And those of us that have served in Congress, and I, I'm sure I speak for all three of us here at this particular table, we walk back and forth the votes between office buildings and, and, and the, the floor. And the number of times we'll be walking in a group and someone will run up and say, say, Joe, uh, good to see you. I, 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 you know how we maxed out for you in the last campaign. We want to do more than that in the next campaign for you. And, and by the way, we have this really important vote tomorrow. We sure hope you could be with us and you'll vote the right way. And by the way, how's your wife, Sally? Well, that is incredibly polite. But it is totally uncivil because it is the implication of true coercion. And there's nothing more threatening than a coercive kind of, of notion that money implies a contract with the individual. And that contract isn't just the last gift. The implication is that it will become more the next time. And so you have a, an ongoing contract with moneyed interest that is always a factor in people's minds. And then when you have this corporate circumstance, members don't even have to be told anything because they know if they take on a particular corporation or a particular uh, industry, that they are potentially going to cause that industry to weigh in quite heavily for their opponent. And so politics is all about raising money and suppressing the opponent's treasury. And you've got to get that out of the process. And uh, the last concept is this. The founders, when they looked at the United States as it was developing, 
thought that there'd be this great diversity of views. You'd have farmers versus manufacturers versus whaling interest or whatever. But today, because of money in politics, all campaigns in every part of the country are nationalized. I mean, in my state of Iowa, for example, uh, major oil comes in on behalf of the Republican Party, major unions come on behalf of the Democratic Party, neither are represented very much in the state itself. I mean, it's a nationalized institution of electorate, and quite frequently, and the great myth is that Republicans get one group and Democrats another, the groups give to both parties, at least the non-labor groups do, and they give to committees of jurisdiction. Uh, and it, it, it is a system that isn't working, and it's because of money, and that is more uncivil than many of the words that are being used in the political process. Thank you. I'm sorry to That's be a, so pontifical. You're passionate. That's good. Thanks, Jim. Jonathan. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. I, I wanted to explain my own focus on this, on this issue of civility and incivility because I think it's very important to understand it uh, in terms of addressing your question of hope. The hope lies in, or the assessment of hope lies in not the bad language and the bad attitudes that we express in, in our public discourse per se. That's, that's a symptom. That's a symptom of something else. If you look at polarization and uh, incivility and you, and you you recognize the very, the very close relationship of them. They feed each other. I think polarization is more basic. It's more the cause. But, but it's reciprocal, uh, the nurturing. And yet, neither of them, polarization and incivility, they don't exist as, as independent factors. Well, they, they're in danger of taking on a life of their own, but they're basically derivative, they're basically fed, they are basically the product of some very basic uh, phenomena and forces in the United States society. And I just wanted to be sure, uh, looking ahead and having heard my colleagues already, there's not going to be a problem here, they, they, they're already addressing it, that we not look at the incivility issue uh, without looking at some of these fundamental forces and phenomena in our society which have a very uh, major influence on and the, the almost uh, uh, incivility is almost a product of them. And there are five I wanted to mention. One, money, which has already been mentioned. I mean, money in politics is just, it's just astounding. It's ubiquitous. It's dominant. I can remember you, you asked to look back to the early Institute of Politics, one of the first things we did when I was uh, director, which must have been, in this case, 30 years ago at least, we had a major conference over a three-day period on money and politics. And Ted Kennedy was very much involved, and John Gardner was, and, and Barney Frank was. And we were talking about, and the report of the Institute about the, about the conference uh, stressed this. We were, we were uh, our politics is a wash in money. And then there was some reform, some campaign finance ideas and initiatives. Well, we're a lot more awash in money now than we were then. The next point is empathy, also mentioned. This country now, it may, have, it may not have less empathy than it used to, but it's certainly got a hell of a lot less empathy than it now needs. And I'm talking about a concern for the other. I'm talking about... Uh, uh, this being a truly egalitarian society. I'm talking about the need to recognize the common good, which has also been mentioned. But basically, this is caring about other people. And we have to do this in our foreign policy. I've been spending much more time on international relations and foreign policy than I have on domestic American politics recently. We've, We've got to have, we've got to change our basic 
mode so that we are thinking about the interests of others in order for our own interests to be properly served. We are not isolated anymore. We, we have got to be constantly thinking of how those other people uh, and those other interests, uh, in addition to our own, can be served. We have uh, a real problem with truth-telling. There isn't as high a premium on telling the truth as there was. There is hyperbole, there is exaggeration, but there's also disinformation and misinformation. And there seems to be the feeling that you can be pretty loose with language and the facts and the truth and get away with it. You're fairly immune from having to pay the consequences of, of speaking uh, inaccurately, of speaking untruthfully. And there doesn't seem to be much of a, of a problem in, in getting away with a major flip in your position on issues. Uh, next, uh, the, the whole question of solidarity and, the, and back to the common good. We don't seem to have a national cohesion. We seem to have lost a sense of a, an American ethos. We, we don't have that consensus here. We don't seem to have a feeling in the way we practice our politics that, that individuals and political entities of various political actors of various types do not seem to hold in reserve a portion of their energy and their efforts and their investments for the whole. Uh, it seems to me, and I'm, you know, I haven't been active, I haven't been alive that long, I feel like I've been alive too long, but uh, I'm not sure that, that, that this hasn't deteriorated also. A sense of what it is to be a nation not just a collection of individual interests and, and uh, needs and uh, obsessions and ideologies and, and uh, uh, problems. What do we hold out to be sure that we contribute to the whole? This gets to the other again. All these issues are integrated and they all have something important to do with, with incivility. And then there's the, the general point that has been mentioned about uh, anomie. There seems to be a multi-dimensional anxiety in the American people, which comes from a lot of things. One is the, the most immediate, the most urgent right now, and most powerful, is dealing with the economic crisis and the suffering and the prolonged and uncertain nature of that. But there's a lot more than that. There's a uh, a very difficult time dealing with, with, with policy complexity. There is uh, really no ability to comprehend what the hell is going to happen in the future. There is the scariness of, of globalization. I think there's a lot of apprehension, a lot of anxiety, a lot of angst, uh, which is built up as a result of these things, of these things um, coming together. And uh, that makes people upset. It makes people fearful. And during such times, some of the more altruistic values of our nation aren't, aren't likely to get as much, as much attention or, or as much priority. But this is exactly the kind of uh, time facing the, the, the set of problems that, that we're facing that, that uh, uh, requires us to be more, this gets to the hopeful point. I mean, I think it's, there's, there's always hopefulness. Uh, what, uh, what strategy and rationality and substance you can put behind it is, is what counts. And of course, I don't think in order to, to deal with the incivility question that we've got to resolve all these other, all these other more endemic and more uh, societal uh, and more fundamental problems, but we ought to keep them in mind and, and their relationship and their impact on incivility in mind as we attempt in more micro ways 
to address the, uh, if we can, and, and I, th I think we're going to discuss some more about remedies here today uh, on the incivility side. Dan and Phil have quick like follow-ups, yeah. I, yeah, I feel that really it's important that we just don't go hand-wringing about America. I mean, this, this country is well, doing a lot of hand-wringing about America. I certainly agree with everything everybody said here about what are some of the problems, but the truth is we have, and you folks have in, uh, in this country, enormous tools that did not exist in the past in order to participate and to make a difference in multiple ways. And there are two very fundamental principles about this country that are very significant, and they help us endure through crisis and others. And that is the principle of openness in our economy, which we call the free enterprise system. It's not totally free, but it's, a, it's an openness that, that you don't find in many societies, and more and more recognize the value of that, and in the political system as well. And while we have these hurdles of money, and we have the hurdles of districting, and, and some of these structural things that we think we ought to change, and it would be useful, the fact is those hurdles have been overridden in the last decade again and again and again on various issues when people got organized. And what, why they're even more effectively organized, your generation, those of you younger than I am, and there are a few of you who might be actually older, uh, they, uh, they actually know how to do this in ways that we're, some of us old conjurers are trying to learn and figure out how to do it. And they can do it rapidly, and they're doing it rapid fire. And one of the problems is politicians are having to catch up with the fact that, hey, people can actually figure out and keep track of what I said four years ago. When I was in Congress, you know, you could get away, to be honest with you, uh, with an awful lot of uh, what you said and did because there's nobody keeping sufficient track of it. Now, today we don't have the local political coverage that we need in our media that we should have, but man, everybody can know in 20 seconds, and partly that's a problem <laughs> that uh, people can respond almost too rapidly. But I would just simply, uh, I wouldn't want anybody to walk out of here if they could throw up their hands, well, get out of the politics. The truth is, people can today have a disciplining impact on corporations in this country. More and more of them are, are showing some sensitivity to the environment and various issues, not because it's the way for them to make money, it's because it's a way, if they don't, it's a way to lose customers and investors. Uh, and and it's, even some of the Wall Street firms are saying, our new young people coming out of Harvard and other places are demanding we move more green. Uh, and so for our recruitment purposes, we have to engage in this. My point is that through the mechanisms of social media, through organization, a lot of this is old fashioned, but some of it's with the modern technology, individuals and groups can, are shaping the political system, the corporate system, the union system, and all of these systems are being threatened. Now that has, is very unsettling to an awful lot of people. Uh, that this can happen, and it won't all go well. But the truth is that we are not in a rut. Well, we can't get out of it all. The rut's in the head, uh, if it's anywhere in this country. I, I, just, I, 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 I kind of agree with Phil. I'd like to really agree with Phil, but I'm not so <laughs> sure it. I agree with Phil. <laughs> First place, uh, our political system was designed to stop things. We have something called separation of powers. It means one foot is on the brake and one foot is on the accelerator at all time. That's what the Founding Fathers wanted. But in a global economy, when we're competing against the Chinese and the Indians and all sorts of new players in the world, and when it's really hard to get anything done, and then you add money to the equation, separation of powers may not be the greatest system in the world in the way we're doing business, and it may actually stop things. And so I think one of the interesting parts of this is to discuss are there changes in our political or our constitutional system that may make sense in, the, in this modern world? And that's meant as a constructive solution. Two other things. I think it was Jefferson who said, against the assault of laughter, nothing can stand. The truth of the matter is, is that we need to lighten up as a society a little bit, and our political leaders need to lighten up, and, our, and, our, and, and the corporate leaders need to lighten up and, and realize that while the problems are severe, that in fact uh, a little bit of self-deprecating humor in our, in our system is, it goes a, a long way. And the final thing I go back to is leadership. The real, the real take is over the long term where we educate people to be leaders in our political system. Leadership skills are not necessarily prime to be a politician today. And that's at all levels. That's at the executive branch, and that's at the legislative branch, it's at the state government, anywhere else. And, and I think that's one of the chores of places like the Kennedy School, is to find ways to train leaders who will then go into the political system, especially at the elected level. I think that's I a good note. Well, people in the 1950s 
The same language was being used as a criticism of the United States government. The same language was that you couldn't run a modern economy with separation of powers. You couldn't uh, defeat the communists with separation of powers. And we did both uh, at the end of the day. The impatience with this political system is enormous historically. I'd be very careful about making fundamental changes. I think we're getting, we're revving up right now. Oh, what I want to do yeah. is invite the audience to come participate <laughs> in this civil yet interesting discussion. We have microphones, we have four microphones in the uh, usual spots. Uh, I want to invite you to come forward. As always, as these directors well know, having moderated many of these events, we have three long standing rules when it comes to questions here at the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. First, identify yourself and your affiliation. Second, a question does not contain a speech, it contains a question. <laughs> And it ends with a question mark, and it only has one question inside of it. I realize that was probably four rules. Uh, we're going to start over here uh, to my left. Hi. Um, thank you all for coming to speak. I was very um, informed. But uh, I'm Christine Hurd, and I'm a member of the college. And I watched the GOP debate on Monday. And besides the fact that Rick Perry can't be bought for only $5,000, I mean, there was a lot of Interesting thing said, but the most thing that interested me that I was wondering if you could comment on was that the people that asked the questions through Twitter and Facebook all seemed very, very reasonable. They all seemed like people who cared about things and maybe, maybe they're not the same things that I care about, but they did. But it was the candidates that were the ones that kind of ran away with it. And I was wondering why you thought that is and what can people do so that they are heard? That's a great first question. Anybody want to take a stab at that one? Well, as Jim's a, leaning as forward. A, as a Republican, <laughs> yeah. let, let me give a mathematical explanation, if that's at all possible. Uh, and I've been using this for quite a long period of time. But if you take uh, America over the last generation or two, we're about a third Democratic, a third Republican, a third no party. Half of a third is, of course, a six. So a sixth of the American people control the Republican Party. A sixth control the Democratic Party, that is, their candidates, et cetera. But if one in four participate in a primary process for legislature, at most, it's usually one in eight or one in 12. But a big primary is one-fourth times one-sixth. That's one-twenty-fourth of the American people. Now, the reason I raise this is, when candidates are being selected in parties today, it's a very small percentage of the American people that are participating. And that small percentage, you ask who it is. On the Democratic side, it's frankly been quite consistent. It's kind of an old-fashioned liberalism. On the Republican side, it's consistent in that it's conservatism, but it's shifted from Goldwater economics to kind of a social conservatism. So to get a nomination, these candidates in both parties, but this, this particular election, there could be no primary for the Democratic nomination. That is, it could be the president will just be the only nominee or the only candidate. He might have an opponent. But people are trying to appeal to a very small section of the American people. And these candidates are speaking to that section of the American people. If you're not of that section, it might seem that they are not speaking to you. But that is the way the candidate selection process works. And the only answer to that is to expand the number of people that participate, or conceivably, and it may well be broached in this coming election. In fact, I will say to you, I predict very strongly that it will. We are very likely to have a very large third party movement in the next presidential election. Uh, and that may change the dynamics, and it'll be a third party in which maybe many millions of Americans will participate in the selection of the candidate because it's going to be based upon uh, a uh, internet convention. And that is going to be novel in the history of the United States based upon uh, technology and in this particular case, there are some very professional people behind it. Uh, and so you may see some changes in the process. But at the moment, from a rational point of view, the group of Republican candidates did quite a, a credible job in speaking to the constituencies. It's going to make a difference in the selection of the candidate. And that, of course, is, is what the goal is. That's why people are running in a primary. Uh, whether that's good enough for the American people, only the American people will decide. You have the same 
bit of a dilemma on the Democratic side uh, at given points in time. Whether it's in this election or not, I don't know. But that is where we are. I think one thing I would like to note, when we have our presidential nominating contests, both the primary and the general, one of the, there's a lot of things that make those races unique, but one of the things that I think in a very positive way makes these races unique is you see a lot more debates for president, presidential races. If you've seen some of the stories about how few times Governor Perry had debated in his races for re-election, he, he didn't have to. There wasn't a political pressure to make him, to force him to do this. And these candidates, every presidential cycle, we see this. All the time. In 2008, we had a lot of debates on both sides because both sides were, had nominating contests. Uh, we've had two already in the Republican race in the last couple of weeks. We're going to have about three or four more over the next month or two. And that's even before we get to the general election contest. So these, this, it's good. It's really good. And, and I think it's a credit to the candidates for participating or being pressured to participate, whatever it may be. And I think your comment about the questions, the media, uh, was, it, that was, you're right. And the media, what they were able to do is use social media to bring audience members from around the country, around the world, and they did some filtering. That's probably why they were so really, they were great questions. But it was, a, but it was good. You know, it was a good balance of good old-fashioned media work and technology. And what the result was some interesting questions. And we learned how the candidates handle under that kind of pressure. And I want to be defensive a little bit from the Republican Party. Uh, there were some very thoughtful statements made. Uh, Newt Gingrich said some very thoughtful things. Uh, Mitt Romney said some thoughtful things. Governor Perry. Uh, showed some very strong convictions. Uh, Michelle Bachman, <laughs> who many people have thought is, is maybe uh, outside the mainstream, said some things that were quite inside the mainstream. I mean, these were candidates that were not totally thoughtless at all. Uh, and they were uh, quite credible, particularly when you understand who they're speaking to. And one of the virtues, if I can just go back. Were you talking about, were you predicting uh, a third party independent, uh, an independent third party candidacy or an independent candidacy? This is, this is a very interesting uh, distinction that, that Jonathan is making, and it's based upon significant public polling data. And the public polling data indicates the country isn't terribly interested in a third political party in the sense of a party, whether you call it the American Party or the Republic Party or whatever, but the American public today is in public and polling data indicating they want a third alternative. And so uh, what is uh, in the making is uh, a very definitive possibility of a third party candidate, or a third candidate. Third, candidate, third option. And then of those identified, I mean, one of the, the technique that is currently under consideration is that an internet convention will be held where people, where leadership will have determined three to six potential candidacies, and if Jonathan is a candidate as a Republican, he will have to choose a Democratic running mate. Uh, if uh, Dan is a candidate, uh, uh, he would, as a Democrat, would have to choose a Republican. I choose you. Right. Uh, well, <laughs> vice versa. Can you guys uh, agree who's going to be on top there? Uh, or would you know? <laughs> We're actually trying to, we're talking about trying to put a forum discussing this issue together uh, later in the semester. Let's go up top to uh, one of the boxes here. Yes. Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Phil Acevedo and I'm a junior at the college. Um, so this whole forum is about the lack of civility in politics and I was wondering um, if the panelists would please share what they think is the most uh, civil period of politics in U.S. history. Well, certainly the year I, the, my election, when I won the election, <laughs> was a very civil year. You know, look, I mean, we ebb and flow, and a lot of it is based upon, I still believe, external factors uh, in terms of, you know, war tends, tends to bring people together, and, and you saw after 9-11, people came together, and it was a lot more civil period. Uh, economic anxiety, uh, disruption of the economy, loss of jobs, that causes the public to look to their government for actions and when they don't see it and they see a lot of fighting, they think the system doesn't work very well and it kind of feeds on itself. And, and then we've talked about some structural reasons why it continues to, to fester. I, I, I think that you have, when you have strong presidents that uh, can set the example and lead and really pull, there's only one elected official for the whole country, that's the president. So when you have strong presidents that come together, 
like, let's say, Roosevelt did during the 1930s. There was a lot of uncivil talk about him, but he coped with it very well. That was the difference. And Ronald Reagan, in, among democratic circles, was viewed as a pariah, but overall, the, po the politicians were smart enough to know that he was very popular, he had a great sense of humor, and he coped with it very well. And, you know, the other presidents have strengths and weaknesses, and so I think that that during these times, it really is important to look at the executive branch and its role in trying to, to soften the harshness of our, a uh, little bit of the day-to-day -day political problems. Jim Scott, I'll come up before we well, get to our next I'm, question. I'm a little surprised at my good friend Dad here uh, because it, it's clear to me in, in relatively modern times, there's been only one particularly civil period uh, and the reason I'm surprised is that the Clinton period? No, it's 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 a fellow Kansan, Dan. Uh, Dwight David Eisenhower oh, yeah. was the closest we had. That was before I had. was born. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I know otherwise, but uh, uh, Eisenhower era clearly was the closest to somewhat uh, cohesiveness, and partly in the nature of Dwight David Eisenhower, who, uh, in all probability, is the most underestimated president of, in in uh, the last century, uh, and. It was partly because of Ike, who had a unique uh, character. Uh, I would argue was the most effective public speaker in the history of the presidency. Uh, that is, uh, any debate coach would give him a, a meager grade, but if the goal of public speaking is to be believed, uh, no one can match Ike. Uh, beyond that, uh, it was also the era. I mean, this is the era uh, of Norman Rockwell, uh, and it was the era of uh, America uh, growing an economy after winning the most important war in the history of the world, of which Ike was a great leader. Uh, and uh, he's the closest to a beloved president, even though at the time he was not perceived to be an immensely strong president, the decisions he made were extraordinarily consequential and involved leadership decisions of an understated nature. I mean, ranging from integrating the Washington, D.C. school system, to sending the 101st Airborne to Little Rock, Arkansas, to put a very small number of students of, uh, of uh, uh, African Americans into school peacefully, uh, or at least without a revolution occurring. Uh, Interstate Highway Act, all of these great acts uh, under Ike, and, and I would argue Frankly, he was our last. Coupled with and very was, strong congressional leadership. Too, yes, yes. Time. But he personified civility himself. Yes, he did. His whole persona was civil in that yeah. sense. And that helped to impact, impact the uh, American public. Yes. Uh, I'm Zach. I'm MP1 uh, at the Kennedy School. Mitch McConnell at one point made a point that I felt was very astute. He said that if something is perceived to have bipartisan support, it is perceived by the public to be right. But if something is perceived to not have bipartisan support, it's perceived by the public to be wrong. And you might say, or you might argue, that the Republican strategy has been built around that statement. Um, it's been, we've seen in the past few years um, this sort of movement towards a lack of bipartisanship, because bipartisanship um, sort of indicates that the majority, dependent, uh, the, the majority agenda is correct. And I think and you, you might argue this is wrong, that there is really an impetus towards party cohesion. There's a lack of uh, reaching across the aisle. And there's just really been a lack of bipartisanship. And I think one might even argue that that's sort of an institutional problem that we have nowadays. Our culture has evolved towards partisanship, but our institutions are still based around bipartisanship. Could you speak to that? Do you think that's a problem? Dan, you were at the bipartisanship. I guess you still have a fellowship. Um, yeah, I think I think you really make some very interesting points. But, but uh, the issue really isn't uh, how you define partisanship or bipartisanship. It's it's the issue of whether people can reach conclusions on public policy issues like how to make our educational system better, how to make us more energy independent, uh, how how to stabilize our national economy and produce more jobs in this country. And, and the issue is, can we as a country get together to, to, to deal with those problem areas? And to do that, in our system of government requires people to reach across 
the aisle to do that. One party, otherwise we might as well have a parliamentary system. And maybe we're moving towards a parliamentary system indirectly. I hope not, but that's kind of the name of the game now. And, and so I, I guess my point in all this stuff is I, I, call, I, I call it less part, bipartisanship than I call it solving national problems. And that is why I think what frustrates the people that our education system, particularly K through 12, is getting worse, not better. That our, we have now 45 million Americans on food stamps, highest in history, and you know, and all the job problems that come with it. And that's been that that's been festering for like 10 or 15 years. It's been getting worse, uh, especially since the year 2000. Uh, and so I, I think what the public is saying is is that we want you to help address our problems. We know there's great differences of ideology on a lot of this stuff. But in America, largely the middle has governed finally. We bring these two things together. And uh, that's how I would define the problem more than the way Mitch McConnell defined the problem. You have to be careful on what you think is bipartisanship uh, to begin with. When I was in Congress, for the 20 years I was there, we had lots of bipartisanship. Both parties were broader based. And so you had some Democrats voting with Republicans and vice versa all the time. Uh, kind of things, but it was that's not the same as when the leaders and the core of the party get together and they agree on something, as Dirksen did uh, with Johnson on civil rights uh, way back in the uh, 60s, uh, early, well, 57, I think it was. Uh, but also the same with the debt ceiling deal. That was a bipartisan deal. It had to be because the the, the party mm -hmm. leaders in this case had to to get there. So part of that is what do you mean by uh, bipartisanship. Bipartisanship, by the way, that's not an end for this country to be striving for. It is a means to get these things done on certain questions, like congressional pay raises. You can't get them through unless you have bipartisanship. Yeah, we've got four folks still sent up. Hopefully, uh, we can get through to all four of you. So ask our panelists to, to be brilliant and succinct. Uh, I, 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 um, and we won't be. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Matt Shuham. I'm a freshman at the college. Um, I thought it was interesting that the Citizens United ruling came up again because I was at a, a panel last week and the same ruling came up even though it was a different topic and I, I think I can make a pretty safe bet that it's come up, it's going to come up plenty of times in the year ahead. Um, it seems like the Tea Party was a reaction to what people viewed as maybe a corporatist influence in politics and even recently there, there are a lot of politicians saying, you know, if I could get along without asking for corporate donations, I would, but then I would get beaten. Um, and when the Obama administration came in, they said they were going to try to publicize the, you know, the lobbyists that came in. It didn't really happen. And it seems like a lot of the issues with partisanship and with civility would be greatly assisted if there wasn't such a big corporatist influence in politics in the first place. What are some moves that can be made so this democracy can actually be more of a democracy? Bill's got one. Got one. We don't have to wait for the Supreme Court. We don't have to wait for the Congress. You and others, and some surely you're doing this, can form organizations which follow major corporations and major labor unions and push and press them to publicly indicate how they will restrict or, and how they will govern their contributions. Go after the source. And you can do that. And some of them are going to discover it's very politically and consumer-wise painful to get themselves too locked into one side or another. Won't work perfectly, but I'll bet you'll have a lot more influence on that than you will on trying to get this U.S. Congress to turn We've seen some success. I mean, Target, as I recall, was, was yeah. targeted, if you will. Share, there's share, because of shareholder proposals mm -hmm. and the ability to influence annual meetings of corporations, there, there are ways to get at this problem. That's certainly one, do one way. Do it now because it sets up a defensive kind of view of corporations as they decide, or by the way, labor unions, because they can take, under the new rules, they can take the union right. dues, which they couldn't do before, and just use them how they want. Uh, so put them on the spot now, and that will have an influence with others when they see that one of the corporations is a target. They don't want to become a target. Some of them, some of them may not care, but. Yeah, and I think earlier they talked about the you know, amendments and things like that that could, uh, that could be in the long run solution, I think, to your, to your question. Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Nathaniel. I'm a freshman. Um, so I know you guys have said that civility kind of comes and goes in Congress, but it's also true that now is a relatively uncivil time, but there are still some things that are off limits, like caning people. 
So do you guys think that, that oh, kind fine. of on, on net we are trending towards kind of more civility in politics? Or do you just think that, you know, things haven't gotten as bad as they were in the you know, 19th century? That might be one for Jim. Well, <clears throat> we all know in the 19th century had the two seminal examples, one of the Vice President of the United States shooting the Secretary's, former Secretary of Treasury at the time dead in a legalized accent, a sense of incivility, that is, it was legal in the state of New Jersey in which the duel occurred. And then the caning and, and 50 years later of, of a House member over a senator. Now, many in the House thought this was a high moment of the House, but, uh, <laughs> but that is the type of thing that we would not have today, we hope. Uh, but when you get feelings so intense, we did see the shooting of a lovely lady, member of the United States Congress, and that is not uh, unrelated to the incivility in American society. Uh, my own personal sense is that all of us that lived through the last generation or so in American politics have seen things get worse in terms of feelings and tenseness. And there's just no uh, semblance to the time Dan and I came into the United States Congress the same day. Uh, from what the era that we came in, Phil was almost there, but he didn't quite make this elite class. I was having four. He was, he, he's a much older, older senior fellow. But, uh, Things can change. I mean, one of the things that's interesting to me is sometimes when I feel downhearted about the Congress, when I walk up to the Hill, I'm amazed how many people I know that I truly like in both political parties and I think are really decent people. And then I've met some of the new people that some in this room might say, gosh, they're kind of Tea Party or gosh, they're way too far to the left. As individuals, they're surprisingly fine people. Uh, and there's something about the system uh, that is taking people that are really committed to representing their constituents and the American people to the best of their ability, but they get tied into a process, they get tied into an attitude uh, that is not exactly what one would consider to be the national interest. And that is something that, that can be corrected. And it can be corrected relatively easily. One way it can be corrected is exactly the way Phil Sharp was talking about earlier. And that is the public should demand it. Uh, and every member of the public should say to their congressman, their challenging candidate, are you going to go to Washington and try to work together to get things done constructively or are you going to go into Washington and be a caucus rigid uh, member of your party? And that's a very interesting question. And the more it's asked, you ask people to think about that. Uh, and I think the public has a very big role in changing this. You know, uh, if I just may add, as I mentioned, when I was at the MPAA, we ran the rating system. And we're never going to have a rating system for comments by politicians. You know, like that's an X-rated statement you made, Senator, or an R <laughs> PG-13 statement you made. But I will have to tell you that words matter, and the languaging is really bad. And I was listening to a guy last night on the radio, Mark Levin. I don't know if you ever listened to this guy. And it was disgraceful, the language he, he was using. And on the other side, Ed Schultz sometimes used very similar languaging. And I'm thinking, where, not just the people, but where are the role models of the people? Where is the faith community? 100 million people a week go to church, okay? They ought to be speaking out on the issue of you can di disagree without being uncivil. And we have a lot of, of others that could stand in that role. And so you're going to be the role models in the future, and you have to participate in that. Because how people talk influences behavior, and it also influences their children. Thank you. Uh, second to last question. <laughs> My name is Alex. I'm a freshman here at the college. Um, just now and earlier, we've been speaking a lot today about um, what role the next generation is going to play in our politics. I mean, obviously you're probably biased as you were um, leaders here at the IOP at Harvard, but do you view our next generation as generally apathetic toward these issues, or do you think that we are going to resonate some of the changes and solutions that you've suggested today? I, per yeah. I, I, think, uh, I think the worm is turning more towards student activism and engagement, at least with respect to in community. Uh, 
I haven't seen it as much in the political system, although the Obama campaign in 2008 did bring a lot of people out. I don't know how that's going to sustain itself in, in the next year on either side of the aisle, but I think the evidence is pretty clear that uh, impact on community-based activities is rising rather dramatically, service and other kinds of things. I think that's fine, but I also think it has to be in the political system as well. So one of the things that's, that gives us hope at the IOP and everybody on the stage and probably most people in the audience that historically transactional costs, the cost to get young people engaged in campaigns were very high. And with the growth of technology, with the growth of social media, uh, the growth of databases and computers, you can really, you can get young people engaged in politics and then those voices can demand a different type of politics. So if you're running for office, uh, you better, you ignore the young voters at your own peril. And I don't think that's going to change in the future. So I think I want to encourage all the, the young folks who are here that your voices can be heard and you can be more effective than you could you know, when I was a student here 20 years ago. Let me throw out a concept of skipping generations. Uh, it's pretty hard not to concur with the notion that we had a greatest generation if you think of World War II. It's also pretty hard when you see some things that have gone wrong in the last <coughs> half generation. Uh, that maybe a, a group of leaders in a time period haven't done as well by their country as they could have. And by leaders, I mean private sector as well as public. And so the case for a new generation of leadership is truly profound. And when you ask this question, the only response I can give you is, A, it's hard as an observer, as a former teacher, not to be optimistic, and B, Nothing could be worse for the United States than if your generation did not get actively involved. And so you have a, a citizenship responsibility to be exactly energetic. And energy can come as a 19-year-old as well as at a 69-year-old. But be energetic now. And I, I think you'll find uh, the... the the rewards would be sensational for the country. Jonathan. I could just come back to something that we talked about before. If you look at the great power of the corporations in the private sector, you look at the moneyarchy that we live in today, and uh, you look at the enormous influence that the private sector, that corporate America, could have on everything we're talking about, if it entered into some of these problems of inequity, of the rich-poor gap, of uh, the whole taxation question, do we think it's patriotic not to pay taxes? So I want to come back to the point that was made earlier about there are various ways of, of, of pushing and forcing the, the private sector in its various parts. My question is, how do we get them to want to do this themselves without being uh, uh, pushed and, and, and shoved from the outside or while being pushed and shoved from the outside. It's got to come from inside. And, and, and if that changed even a little bit, the way I perceive it, would make an enormous difference on getting at the problems we're talking about. Well, Jim probably had the solution here. People are going to go into corporations or into NGOs or into universities to work, and they are on the inside. And they can help raise voices and behave in ways that help make uh, organizations more socially and nationally aware of problems. They can't, they're not going to become governments and be able to do everything, but they certainly can behave differently. And we have enough experience to know that whether it's NGOs or any of these organizations, they do behave differently. Some of them do extraordinary things beyond their just narrow self-economic uh, interests. Others don't. And others are just mean. I was going to say, one institution that's actually doing this quite well and is going to produce a lot of people back into society who I think will be perhaps in the generation that Jim talked about is the military. Yeah. Yeah. And it's been profound. The leadership skills that the military trains people to be, the responsibility, the, the community orientation, and then those people, whether, uh, you know, I mean, uh, whether anybody here is in the military, and I never served in the military, but 
it's, it's, it's the one really great success institution of our modern times in doing by these the way, trends. We come out of, well, I come out of the 1960s when in school you would never have heard anybody say, make that kind of statement. Never. In fact, it was a resistance to the military and it being one of the wicked institutions of America that was warlike and everything else. Now, I, that critique probably wasn't correct at the time, but certainly there has been a significant change uh, uh, in that, apart from the instrument that when we use it and how we use it. Let, let me make a distinction between three institutions in America. You've got the United States military, you've got the United States politics, you've got the United States corporation. Intriguingly, the corporation is a bastion of American pragmatism. Politics is the bastion of American ideology, and the, and the military is the bastion of American service. And for example, many people in this room will disagree with American foreign policy. But who doesn't respect the people that have served? Everybody respects the military for serving, the young kids that are serving. Uh, and so one of the reasons we're in the difficulty of policy is that politics got ideological. Yeah. I think the corporation is part of the answer. Uh, and there are lots of pragmatists in American corporations and also people fed up with American politics. Yeah. The anger in the corporate world against the political institutions is incredible. On the tax issue with Jonathan Ray's, there is a self-interest in a corporation not to pay high levels of taxation. But there is a sense that everybody ought to pay their fair share relative to each other in the corporate world. And nothing is more frustrating if I'm a corporation in one field that pays almost no taxes and fills a corporation in another field that pays much higher taxes. And it happens all the industries of the future, for example, high tech, pay at the maximum end of, of the tax scale. All the corporations of the past pay at the low end of the tax scale. And there is a case for tax simplification and a case for a total reform of the tax codes. And the corporate world in the majority will support that. There'll be elements of it that won't, but they're oddly enough in the minority. And so there is a basis for real change in this country if people just recognize and it. The one of the leading anti-hunger organizations in the United States is Walmart. Just interesting, so just to reinforce what you're talking about. Last question. Uh, my name is Asha Stout, coming from the southwestern United States, uh, a graduate of Prescott College for the liberal arts, the environment, and social justice. Um, in the spirit of public good, um, it's hard for me to, to battle with these, these challenges of um, things like Citizens United, the need for campaign finance reform, and this passion for, for an idea of tax simplification. And my question for you around propositions like Ezra, um, the proposal for environmental and social responsibility, an amendment to the Constitution to, to reverse Citizens United. Is constitutional amendment really on the table as, as a means to that end? And, and would a proposal of tax simplification really be on the table to make this huge system and all these structures, 700 pages of text for each code in, the, in, the, in our tax system, can we really change those things? Constitutional amendments, tax structure, um, the role of corporations in, in the political process today. Thank you. What do you all think about the likelihood of, of amendments to the Constitution actually being adopted? Uh, I, I think it's remote. Uh, these things don't happen without real grassroots uh, support. Uh, I don't see that happening just yet. I, I think it should, but it hasn't. So therefore, and that takes activism and takes organization and campaigns and all the other stuff. So therefore, if that's not gonna happen, you can't give up on the subject, in my judgment. You've got to look for alternative ways to get it to happen. So that's compelling or embarrassing, let's say, the corporate world to look at these issues. And there's, with very older democracy, you can influence their behavior. Getting role models in American society to speak of these issues and to encourage their members and their public to participate in efforts in cleaning up the American democracy. I mean, there are a lot of ways to skin that cat beyond just a constitutional amendment. I think. And, and the tax reform question? I, I think it, it is possible. The only mistake I think you made in your question, you said 700 pages of the tax code. Actually, you add a couple <laughs> zeros to that, and you're closer <laughs> to the truth. Per code. Yeah, per code. Now, in, in terms of change, I think if there are no uh, 
critical changes in this and some elections go on and things get as bad as they might, you might get a movement towards a constitutional amendment. But like Dan, I think you're more likely to get change in other directions. I will give you a statutory change that I think would be helpful. It wouldn't solve, but it would solve a lot of it. Uh, I think one ought to have a, a bill passed to the United States Congress that says, if you're going to allow corporations to give money in campaigns, every shareholder has to sign off. And you might say, why that? Well, if you are a, a Democrat and hold 100 shares of GM, and the president of GM says, I want to give to the Republicans, that is a taking of your asset. I mean, an absolute taking of your wealth. And I think the case for such a, 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 a bill is terrific. Now, whether the Supreme Court would hold that constitutional, I don't know. It might give them a chance to readjust their thinking on the issue itself. Uh, there are other slight legislative things that can occur, but I think you're more likely to get changed by a new member or two of the court. But that doesn't mean, and it could be named by a Republican, could be named by a Democrat. To me, any conservative in America should be outraged by this ruling. Any liberal should be outraged by this ruling. And so I could visualize uh, anyone appointing someone that might have an independent judgment, and it's just going to take one vote if it replaces the right uh, Supreme Court justice. Uh, now, having said that, I don't rule out the possibility of a constitutional amendment uh, coming about, but I, I don't say that's likely in the very near future, and it, it takes, it's kind of a process thing uh, that takes some time. I, I love his statutory recommendation, and I think it's terrific. Uh, I probably, a more pra pragmatic uh, approach would be a majority of stockholders or a majority of union members or two-thirds, something that doesn't have to be absolute. But I, I will say on the tax reform, I believe we're actually building up to a major restructuring of taxes in this country, whether it will happen or not. So it is important for you and others to begin in that conversation. It obviously is not going to happen this year, although they may take some, a few steps. But I think there's more and more worry that we've simply got a tax code that is inappropriate to the modern globalized economy. And so there, you've got to begin doing that. And, and, and we, we went through tax reform. Actually, I was a Democrat in, in, in the Reagan administration. and. Uh, uh, and we made major simplifications. I didn't agree with all of the, the changes, but it was impressive uh, what happened then. And then everybody on the Republican as well as the Democratic side went back to the same old thing of, well, well, we'll use it as a social engineering mechanism, and so we've got provisions in there for everything under the sun. One, 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 just, uh, one of the things I've thought about, why don't we ban congressmen from raising money when the Congress is in session? Now, that may mean the shortest congressional sessions in the history of the world. But, but, Not a but, bad thing as a but, Republican. You know, you know, in limited government. But anyway, I mean, I'm just saying that that may sound flaky, but there may be ways to try to deal with this problem a little bit. And that's, not a, that's how state legislatures mostly yeah. do with the situation. Well, we want you to continue this conversation about this topic and a lot of other topics. We're having a reception as soon as we finish here up in the penthouse, which is on the top floor of this building. Uh, if you've never been up there, don't worry about it. Just follow the crowd heading up there, and we can continue conversing about this. We can talk about some of the great forms we've had at the IOP over the last 45 years, and some of the great things that are gonna happen over the next 45 years. Now, two things we are gonna talk about for next week, I wanna encourage you to come back. On Monday, we're gonna have a panel talking, entitled Inside the Arab Awakening. Uh, we saw what happened in the spring, we see what happened, frankly, every day. And so we've got a panel of experts uh, from campus uh, talking about this, that'll be Monday at six o'clock. And then Friday, next Friday, a week from today, at 4 o'clock, same time, same place, the president of Chile, President Pinera, is going to be here in the forum. This is going to be a packed house. So this is a lottery forum, which is kind of unusual for us. The lottery is still open, and I want to encourage everybody to visit the IOP's website, iop.harvard.edu. Uh, the lottery closes on Tuesday, the 20th at noon. So anytime between now and then, uh, we want to encourage members of the public, students, undergraduates, graduate students, to enter the lottery. Uh, but that's going to be an exciting event this coming Friday. So go upstairs um, when we're finished here. And so to conclude, let's thank these men on the stage. Let's thank Senator Shaheen for tonight and for their service and for their commitment to the IOP. Thank you. Congratulations.